Great. So I think we're on air now. Uh, good afternoon. Good uh, morning, everyone, wherever you are uh, around the world. This is John MacArthur. I'm a senior fellow at the UN Foundation, also non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I'm delighted to be here today with uh, three fantastic uh, experts, leading thinkers, and practitioners on the issue of uh, foreign aid and Canadian approaches to aid. We uh, Maybe if I can just uh, go around uh, the table, so to speak, uh, the digital table, we have Professor Stephen Brown from the University of Ottawa, uh, who's joining us today, I think, from his office in Ottawa. We have Professor David Black from Dalhousie University uh, joining uh, from Halifax. And also we have uh, Dr. Molly Den Heyer uh, from St. Francis Xavier and the Cody Institute, uh, also uh, out in the Maritimes. And uh, we're delighted that they're all here today. Uh, the purpose of this conversation is to try and think about uh, what a new Canadian conversation on aid might look like. Uh, our friends at the CIC and OpenCanada.org have brought this together and have launched, uh, I think, a terrific series where they're getting voices from across the country and across disciplines, across uh, specific elements of expertise and the, this big, uh, wide topic of foreign aid and saying, how can we uh, bring this together for a more systematic conversation uh, over the course of perhaps a generation? Uh, I've shared my own views uh, with a couple of blog posts earlier this summer, uh, but this is a chance to hear from people who have been spending a lot of time thinking about this and uh, really been putting in, I think, a lot of the heavy lifting that we can all be grateful for to think through, you know, how do we understand not just where we are and where we've been, but where do we need to go? Uh, and so today I'm just going to be moderating a conversation. We're here for about uh, 40 to 45 minutes. And I'd love to just go around the table to start this out with, with a, a very basic question. Uh, we're at the uh, tail end of the Millennium Development Goals, which have in many ways become the uh, de facto reference point for global development efforts, not complete uh, as a reference point, not complete as goals, but in a sense the baseline. And of course, we're under, uh, we're in the process of a very active conversation around uh, what should come after that. So it's timely that we're thinking about this in Canada and how that might fit with the broader global need. And I'm curious, as we think about longer term time horizons, not just uh, the next election cycle, but really uh, a longer term global development cycle, if you will, what are the types of priorities that you think are out there that we should be as Canadians uh, keeping in mind or even having at front of mind as we think about uh, 2030, for example, which is uh, the loose reference point that most people are talking about around the world for the coming generation? So I'm curious, uh, maybe Stephen, you first, uh, what are the things that you think are out there that Canadians should be seeing as the real, the demand side of the equation? Uh, for global development? Well, the Millennium Development Goals have been very good at bringing attention to a lot of goals, including maternal and child health and education and reducing poverty. But it's only taken us part way, so that the goals would be reduced by 50% or reduced by 75%. But, you know, what about the remaining 50% or 25% of the people who haven't been reached by the additional efforts that have gone with the MDGs? So, in some cases, we should be thinking about zero. So, you know, 0% hunger, nobody goes hungry. Universal um, access to primary education, maybe even secondary education. Obviously, the environment and specifically climate change are going to be huge issues for the future. I think more thinking needs to be done around inequality as well. The recent high-level forum on the post-2015 era was criticized for not talking enough about inequality. Um, so I think there are lots of issues and one important thing would be for Canada to be engaged in the global dialogue. What we've seen in recent years is Canada has been disengaging around um, climate change specifically, around the environment, around uh, desertification when you think of the UN Treaty. So I think Canada needs to not pick on the UN, not sort of um, stomp around and say we only believe in multilateral efforts when it benefits Canada. 
but really think on a global scale what's good for the globe, not what's good specifically for Canada or Canadian businesses. Interesting. Great points. What do you think, Molly? Uh, how does it look like as a somebody who spent a lot of time as a practitioner as well in these areas? Uh, what do you see as the key key needs out there? Well, the one of the key needs I sort of have uh, been thinking about is not so much about the uh, the 2030 and the 2015 timelines, because these are timelines that we've put on, and it's policy has a very important role in sort of marshalling our efforts towards these goals. But we shouldn't really, um, we shouldn't really sort of think about them as the only solution, because there inherently there are a set of policies we're working towards, and we've seen policies come and go in the development industry for quite some time. And they sort of have this way of crashing on the shore after 15 to 20 years. What, we, what I would like to see is more of a reframing of the debate and trying to figure out why are these, what, is, what do these policies do and how can we ensure that they actually meet their intended goals of uh, reform and transformation. And to, for me, that is bringing in sort of a uh, looking at some of the, the, the hidden power and the invisible power, sort of the underlying narratives that run in the development industry. And so really, if we want to do transformation, if we want to have a real change, I think it's about bringing out some of those underlying uh, uh, narratives and making the policy a little bit more accurate to um, the whole industry or in the whole development issue as, as a whole. So instead of just this global debate, make it linking it to the national and linking it to the local as well. And rethinking policy, not just a particular policy. Are there examples of issues that you think are most important for those transformed uh, policies to address? Yeah, one of the ones that I've sort of picked up in this paper that I'm working on is sort of the idea of the north-south charity model. And I think we see that here in Canada a lot. We think of aid as, something, as a rich country giving to a poor country, the haves and the have-nots. Um, but we need to re sort of frame that more towards looking at not as a Canada as a leader or a middle power, but perhaps Canada as a global citizen not like some common one of the uh, things that we've been sort of working here at the Cody is looking at sort of issues not as a global south and not as the north, but these are common community development issues that run across the globe. I think Michael Edwards was saying in a recent paper it's about pockets of poverty and and pockets of conflict now, so it's not really that national uh, or, or country divide that we used to have in the Cold War era. Very, very interesting points. Thank you. And uh, David, can I ask you, uh, you've probably been thinking about this for longer than any of us, uh, what do you see as, as the major issues? I, I say that with respect uh, for, for the stature. No, no, it just, just it's to be clear. Much I, 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 I take the point. Um, it, there's always a certain risk in uh, in uh, in going third in these things because, of course, several of your your best points have been taken. I, I completely. I mean, we can look at this in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is to look at it in terms of particular themes uh, that uh, would resonate with the Canadian experience, but that are also uh, enormously salient to uh, global challenges and that could uh, mobilize um, interests uh, in uh, across a a range of, of countries and, and actors. Um, and uh, I had thought, like Stephen, of the, the enormous challenges of, of managing poverty alleviation efforts uh, in a context of gr growing sustainability challenges. I think that's a really critical issue and it's one that, um, I, to pick up on one, what Molly just said, I think it's a, a, these points need to resonate with the Canadian experience as well. We're part of these challenges. We need to be focusing on priorities that are the same things that we need to be grappling with in our own uh, domain. I think inequality is another one that uh, that is a is going to emerge as an enormous uh, challenge for our generation. It's hard to marry uh, uh, the imperatives of growth with both sustainability and inequality. Uh, uh, several issues that are particular to the Canadian context, um, and not particular to the Canadian, but particular to Canadian expertise. Uh, would be issues of, uh, of gender, which has always been an, uh, an area of Canadian uh, interest, special interest and in leadership, uh, is enormously important in the last round and will be in the next round. 
Uh, uh, one of our authors, Christina Clark Kazak, makes the point that children and youth is an area that Canada stands to carve out an important leadership role. Um, I think we have to get to grips with the challenges of extractive industries, uh, the challenges associated with uh, 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 sustainable extraction and uh, responsible governance uh, at both the national and transnational levels. Uh, but there are also process issues that need to be gotten to grips with, uh, one of which is that I think that we need to take the imperative of ownership seriously. Uh, we need to be more responsive to the priorities of uh, uh, people and societies in developing countries themselves. We also need to engage more effectively with the panoply of new development actors, some of whom are new donors, some of whom are non-state actors uh, that need to be brought into a more effective development partnership going forward. Well, we've got an amazingly uh, broad agenda which uh, already, which is fitting because it's a big global world of seven uh, billion people and counting and uh, I think one of the very interesting points that's come up here is how there's not just the transnational issues, but increasingly the within country issues that are uh, so central. And, and that raises, of course, hosts of questions around, uh, you know, what should a, uh, an external actor do in those cases? Uh, it's not the only issue, but it, it's certainly one of them. But this notion of, uh, of growing the conversation. I thought it was a very nice phrase that you had there, David, just something that needs to resonate with the Canadian experience uh, as we match these issues. Mm -hmm. That does raise the question of even how to define a conversation, uh, whose experience in Canada. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that many people see is that this is an Ottawa conversation uh, or this is uh, maybe a government uh, bureaucratic conversation. Sometimes it, uh, people might call it a Globe and Mail conversation, uh, but uh, or a, a CBC conversation. But how do, how does it become really a public conversation, or or what does that even mean here? What do, what are the groups and constituencies that you think need to be involved? Um, I, I think that uh, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question directly. I think the thing that right. has struck me in the last uh, in the last probably generation is the degree to which uh, there has been a growing uh, insularity to the debate about uh, development cooperation, the degree to which civil society actors became enmeshed in a set of relationships that were highly intense and intensive, uh, and I think you're right that they really revolved around a kind of Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto triangle. Uh, and that in the process, the, um, the articulate, the, the link between those groups and the social bases that they, um, that they once represented uh, has been disrupted or interrupted. Um, and I guess what strikes me as an educator is that is the degree to which uh, young Canadians are enormously interested in these issues, but very disconnected from the debate as it unfolds in, in Ottawa. Uh, and uh, so um, I think there's a need to reconnect uh, with uh, groups, uh, with, between civil society groups and their respective bases, but there's also a need to connect much more um, effectively with uh, young Canadians and this imperative of global citizenship that they feel, but they don't connect to the Ottawa-based conversation. Could I add something to that? Please, yeah, we'll I, go I right agree through. entirely with what David says, but I want to add that that we do see um, very important pockets of interest across the country. And if we were to just say, and I know David didn't really mean to say this, but if we were to characterize it as just, you know, Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, that really doesn't do justice to a lot of people who are active, to a lot of NGOs that are based across Canada, to, you know, cooperation um, groups in, you know, Sherbrooke or Trois-Rivières or in BC. And a lot of church groups as well are very involved in is issues relating to international development and global social justice. Mm -hmm. So I, and, and as David points out, young people from across the country, uh, we all teach uh, in development studies, and so we have students from across the country and around the world. So clearly there really is a very broad-based interest, but as you've mentioned, John, part of the challenge is, is to connect this. Right. What do you think, I, Molly? Yeah, yeah and, and I think part of the challenge was also to um, 
bring up the level of debate in some ways in the public. And I think there are, as Stephen put uh, so well, uh, there is a great deal of interest, and we have an uh, increasingly diversified Canadian society, but we also need to bring the level up a little bit and make sure that we have some depth to this support. I think uh, Dominic Sil Silvo's paper that uh, he'll be presenting on the weekend does a really good job of saying, listen, we've always had support for aid. It's been kind of consistent, but it needs to be more a deepened in a more substantive dialogue and rooted in that substantive dialogue. And Can I just pick up on that point? Can I be next? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, I think that that we we've had uh, we've slipped into a very shallow debate about development challenges and about Canada's responsibilities in relation to those challenges, and we've been so focused and government uh, people in particular have been so focused on. Um, good news stories and risk aversion that we we we've we have um, avoided the kind of mature debate that we need to have about development as a very long term challenge, uh, as one that that has always everywhere required a high level of of um, experimentation and contingency and adaptability. Uh, and we need to be uh, to have a much more honest debate uh, that would resonate much more with people's real experiences. The the, the pretense that we can do these things in a risk-free way has to be uh, transcended. Absolutely. I, what I wanted to say was actually related to that. Um, and Ian Smiley has written a paper that he'll be presenting at the conference this weekend that speaks a lot to that. But we've developed this unhealthy obsession with results, wanting to see something that we can count, something that we can take a picture of, something that we can put the, the flag on, something we can put the maple leaf on, and, and you know have it produced within three to five years. And th this is a bit of a trap. It's actually a huge trap because the more the more people, the media, etc., demand that, the more, more project designers will pander to that, um, the more politicians will make snap judgments about effectiveness based on whether they can do that or not. And if 50 years of development and uneven success in development has taught us something, is that it's not as simple as just building a few schools and at the end of three years saying, see, we bought, we, we built, you know, 15 schools or whatever. That development is a transformational process and you can't do that in the three to five year cycle. So, you know, successive CETA ministers have promised that, you know, we will show results and it's all about results. And then the media will go and say, we did see the results or we didn't see the results. Or the Senate will send a committee and they'll say, we saw the results or not. And there's this quick jump that just because we didn't see the maple leaf flag, flag anywhere, that the money was all wasted. So we really do, as David was saying, have to take, and Molly, take the level of debate uh, much higher to a deeper understanding of what's involved and move away from what Molly was saying earlier about this charity driven model. It's not just about donating a school or our used clothes or something. And, and yes, transformational work is very complicated and it's not simply about donations. And that's where I found quite disappointing around the public debates at the time of the merger that was announced between CETA and the Ministry of the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. One senior Conservative Party insider who's held very important positions was making fun of CETA because CETA did capacity building and he didn't even know what that was. And clearly CETA was going along the wrong path because it was wasting its time doing this thing that he couldn't understand. Right. But what seems so sad to me was that capacity building is actually something really, really simple. So there's the old adage that, you know, you can give somebody fish, or you can teach them to fish, and one, you know, they'll have a meal, but the other one they can feed themselves for a lifetime. Well, capacity building is exactly that. It's teaching someone to fish, or, you know, helping somebody develop the capacity to do sustainable agriculture, or et cetera. So to me, so many of these facile, off-the-cuff comments what, rather than people educating themselves or the media, edu media educating them or politicians, I wish politicians would educate themselves and other people, they just make these quick dismissals about what works, what doesn't work. You know, the minister goes to Haiti, he sees garbage and then announces that, you know, clearly all Canadian foreign aid to Haiti has been a big waste of money and he's going to freeze it. 
So I think we need a much more subtle, deep understanding across the board, media, academics, NGOs, politicians, bureaucrats. And we have to bring the conversation to that level and not try to score these quick points or, or make these snap judgments. Can I, can I ask a question of all of you based on this? Having been involved with uh, some of the uh, debates in Canada and in the government over the past several years, I, for example, was somewhat involved with the 0 0.7 debate in 2005. And uh, my experience was quite resonant with the one you guys are describing, where I've likened it to uh, a 101 level public conversation uh, was started it, and then maybe there was a 201 rebuttal, uh, but then uh, that was it. And then it ran out of time in order to get to the upper classes of real uh, seriousness on the issues. So there's so many of these conversations that are aid good versus aid bad. Uh, which is, of course, a, a facile and unhelpful uh, dichotomy, in my view. But I would also ask you, and maybe uh, with a, a casual provocation, I think some of the uh, questions around long-term transformation, which are some of the points that have come up here, are, of course, part of development. But in my experience, they miss some of the medium-term things, which are actually very measurable, which are resonant with the Canadian success or Canadian experience. And that's the perhaps the greatest transformation of the global development system in the past decade is in global health, mm -hmm. where we've seen that the uh, the launch of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, to be Malaria, Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, uh, concurrently the U.S. major bilateral programs, PEPFAR and PMI for AIDS and malaria. These have actually helped to spur, backed by a lot of academic engagement, I would say very measurable results with uh, over time transformation, most likely on the economic implication. But I find it very surprising, but I'm curious what you think, that this is not a centerpiece of the Canadian aid conversation, especially because Canada was one of the founding funders of the Global Fund, for example, mm -hmm. uh, at the earliest days. Uh, this should be an, one of the great sources of Canadian pride that it's just helped establish a multilateral institution, had a strong oar in the water, and this institution has helped transform the expectations even of what development might be. Mm -hmm. And I, that, I find that we miss points like that in our public discussion because we get so focused on CETA or mm -hmm. uh, is aid good or bad, but I'm curious what do you make of that? That's just my perspective. Do you think that there are more of these things that are medium-term measurable things that are maybe getting missed, or am I just missing them and not seeing where they're discussed? Um, I'll weigh in on that. My Molly might want to, to jump in as well, but uh, um, I think you make a really good point. Uh, I think that there are a whole series of, and you make this point in your Open Canada uh, debate starter uh, as well, there have been a whole series of very concrete um, initiatives that have had enormous uh, and measurable successes. Canada has rarely been, how could it ever be, the, 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 the only or the principal uh, protagonist of those initiatives. And so that comes back to a point that Stephen made earlier, that, that uh, there's this kind of debate between outputs versus outcomes. We need to be much more focused on what we have achieved collectively with others in very concrete and measurable ways. I think where this connects to the more uh, transformative and longer term agenda is that Oftentimes, those initiatives are enormously successful as one-off, issue-specific successes. The degree to which they are then uh, uh, sustainable become part of, for example, if you take those specific health, uh, health uh, achievements, health system strengthening that would allow those achievements to be sustained over time is where we get into a, a much more mature conversation where we can link those concrete achievements to the kinds of longer-term governance transformations um, and multi-actor coalitions that will ensure their sustainability over time. So you need to connect those achievements to the longer-term changes that need to be made. Where I think we've missed the boat in Canada, frankly, uh, I think we, um, and why those, those issues have not resonated in the way that they probably should have, um, is I think, frankly, that we got into a rather unhealthy um, um, 
uh, polarized partisan environment around the debate on aid so that uh, achievements that were linked with previous governments tended to be discounted uh, and there has been a succession of governments that have sought, and, and indeed ministers that have sought to place their uh, imprimatur, their brand on Canadian priorities rather than saying okay this is a this is a, an effort that has been part of a collective Canadian effort that has unfolded over the last decade so we need to try to transcend the hyper partisanship that has come to revol uh, to uh, attach to this issue I think Molly, yeah. what, what are your views? Or can I ask Molly? Yeah. <laughs> um, well I was just thinking of a couple of things um, sorry Stephen um, <laughs> One is what do we judge as a success rate because um, there have been a lot of successes and we're not very good at putting them out there but there have been along with a few boondoggles there have been some clear measurable uh, leaps forward but what we because it's taxpayers money we seem to think that we need to have a hundred percent success rate if we were in the business world we would not have a hundred percent success rate billionaires lose money all the time and then they regain it and this is part of what we need to sort of be have what I call a humble approach to international development which is that we need to yes there are a few things where we can set out a clear short-term goals and obtain and we should do that but there are longer term transformational processes that often require us going from person to person to person and sort of building up some educational and community leadership so while we do have these big international initiatives that I think are important we really need to bring to light the more difficult, nuanced complexity behind community change and changing basically our human behaviors and the way we structure our, our societies because that's essentially what development is trying to do is change the way people interact with it or relate to each other. So in that way I think we need to work on both and we need to have those sides dialogue a little bit more and I, I, I sort of see that a little bit as a part of the international development milieu where you have the large policy venues and then you have the small NGOs working with a, a community or four or five communities and getting that dialogue together is really where we can actually sort of marshal together because it's not one or the other it's both sides working towards a common goal. But, sorry Stephen I cut you That's off. Good. Stephen yeah sorry I didn't mean to cut you off. No I, I wanted to just add a little thing to what David said is that we've got to think more about Canada and you know Canada acting and not the conservative government or the liberal government acting so I don't know what the liberal party is thinking right now but I remember while Mike, Michael Ignatieff was leader of the liberal party he had said that you know how the the conservative party had shifted the focus from Africa to Latin America if and when you know or when in his words the liberals were back in power they would shift it back to Africa and that just perpetuates the idea that you know Africa is a liberal issue, Latin America is a conservative issue, and then as our governments alternate, and perhaps with a different party as well eventually, um, that the priorities would keep changing. And and we've got to stop thinking them as David was saying as partisan priorities because one of the most important things for development is predictability. It's it's the reliability of flows, the non volatility, because we can't expect the government of say Malawi to plan to have Canadian cooperation because we've just announced that you know it's our new country of focus and we're building a new embassy and scaling up our aid program and then five years later announcing a new list or actually it was four years later announcing a new list of priority countries cutting off Malawi closing down the embassy selling the new building that we just built that's so clearly not the way to do development mm -hmm. and then to go back to your question John about these medium term and more measurable things. It's absolutely true that there are some things that are more measurable. And I didn't mean to suggest by my remarks that you know we should never try to measure anything. Um, but things like health, it makes a lot of sense to to you to quantify outcomes. For things like the rule of law or gender equality, it makes a lot less sense. And though you can reduce the malaria rate dramatically in a five year period it's a lot harder to transform gender relations in a sustainable way in five years. Uh, this is uh, so a conversation that we could carry on for hours. I'd love to. I'm jealous I can't be at the conference this weekend. <laughs> but uh, I think this notion of how to build the sustained, less partisan, at least par 
uh, partisan perceptions around what's going on. As I mentioned in my, my blog piece earlier this year, I actually find that the, the partisan perception is very disconnected from the underlying reality, uh, which is actually much less partisan on a long-term view. But I'm wondering uh, to what extent any of you have uh, looked at the UK discussions, for example, as a reference point, because in 2002 or 2000, uh, UK actually was in a pretty similar place in terms of its amount of foreign aid, uh, a lot of the general policies on foreign aid to Canada. Uh, but uh, over the course of a few years, it really changed dramatically at, at, and the decisions it made, and those, of course, have been across all parties. So uh, now David Cameron is uh, the leader from the conservative side on 0 0.7, uh, saying we're not going to balance our books on the backs of the world's poorest, carrying forward the explicit commitments of the Labour government as a centerpiece of, of his strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see how that came to be. Uh, again, I, I have my own theories, but uh, I'm curious what you think a country like Canada can learn from that about consistency. Uh, what are the different uh, segments of a national debate that can feed into that for there to be, obviously there are some policy changes with the new government, but really an underlying societal robustness to this. Are there things we can learn from that? So I, if I can oh, go ahead, just start on that, and I'm sure Stephen knows a lot of a lot about these issues. He's spent quite a bit of time in Europe of late, and uh, my my perception is it comes back to something that's a little bit different from what we were talking about earlier, which is the need to uh, engage much more effectively the the base of societal interest uh, at the level of communities and civil society organizations, which is enormously important and has been a big part of the British story. The, the fundamental point about the British story is that this was a leadership-driven initiative, uh, that it, it, it came out of a particular configuration of, of powerful personalities within the Labour Party that were in turn connected to social bases that cared about these issues. Uh, and it really uh, managed to, it lifted the debate about these issues uh, to a series of, of um, uh, concerns uh, both around sustainability and, uh, and specifically around Africa that it managed to construct a, a bipartisan uh, interest around um, that resonated with the base of the Labour Party in the, in the first instance but then uh, created an environment in which it was simply, un, if, for want of a better term, unpatriotic uh, to, to challenge those priorities. Now, um, I think, um, so I, I think that one of the points that uh, one of our participants, Adam Chapnick, makes is that there's, along with the need to engage social base, there's a need to engage the political elites, uh, where the, the level of dialogue, the level of understanding of these issues has actually declined, I think, in the past generation quite markedly. Uh, and so there's a, there's a need for a kind of two-way conversation and two-way education process that needs to occur. There is one caveat to the British case that I, I would want to kind of register, which is that um, that uh, the idea that you can achieve a robust consensus around development priorities um, is certainly a worthy objective, but it's 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 unrealistic in practice to imagine that we can wish away all of the uh, the um, Con competing priorities, the, the contested uh, definitions of what development uh, should involve. And so part of a mature conversation is achieving a robust consensus around a commitment to, uh, to global development and to global justice, but at the same time allowing for difference within that debate and allowing for contestation uh, in a way that to some extent the British uh, debate has submerged. Mm, interesting. David? Do you want to jump in on that? Stephen? Or pardon me, Stephen. Pardon me, Stephen. <laughs> I was David. <laughs> Sorry. Almost interchangeable sometimes. <laughs> See, I, I, that's I think, how deeply I was listening. <laughs> I, I think David put his finger on it when he identified leadership as the core issue in the case of the UK. Mm -hmm. um, specifically Claire Short, who, who was sort of the powerhouse between the creation of their um, Department for International Development. But she couldn't really have gotten very far if she didn't have the support of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the equivalent of the, Prime, the Finance Minister. Mm -hmm. 
So it can't just be, you know, one strong CETA minister or one strong, you know, minister in charge of international development. That's not sufficient. It would, you know, it's important, but it's certainly not sufficient. There has to be a consensus in cabinet that um, international development is important, the plight of the poor in poorer countries is important, that it, not all decisions must revolve around Canadian interests. And when you have political leadership in place, they can enact institutional change that can endure. So um, passing the law like in the UK, that it would be illegal for the UK to take into account British commercial interests when allocating aid goes much further than our Better Aid Bill in Canada, the Overseas Accountability Act. And uh, if we were to have that kind of act, that would force this government, future governments to behave differently. So political leaders not only do things, but they can create institutions that in a sort of path-dependent way um, condition the behavior of future political leaders. The awareness of the British public of development issues uh, is also key. And I think part of that is a legacy of empire, that there are so many British people who have lived abroad or whose parents lived abroad. There's also a tremendous amount of immigration from developing countries. They have an NGO community that is much stronger than ours and much more appreciated by the government. And I think a key difference in um, with the British government, whether it was under labor, labor or the current coalition, is a willingness to hold an open dialogue for DFID to actually hold consultations, see what people say, be open to criticism, um, invite criticism, in, you know, organize events at which people can criticize British aid policy, uh, have staff criticize and not be penalized for it. And CETA has been under attack for so long um, from different ministries, from different parts of society, that they have very much a circle the wagons mentality. So admit no mistakes. And this this goes to, to what Molly was saying. So for instance, if you know, you open up a restaurant, and I don't know what the statistics are, you know, one-third of restaurants fail within the first year, or maybe it's two-thirds, I don't know. But let's say it's one-third. That's actually quite a bit. But nobody's going to say we should stop opening restaurants. Right. We should actually understand better what makes for a successful restaurant. Um, Engineers Without Borders started a campaign a few years ago about admitting mistakes and, you know, investigating them and understanding. But unfortunately in Canada, the reaction has been to deny that anything is wrong. And so we get incredible cognitive dissonance. Uh, so if you look at the CETA website, um, you see that everything in Haiti is wonderful and great. Everything in Afghanistan is wonderful and great. Then the minister goes and says to Haiti and says, things aren't working. It's terrible. I'm freezing aid. So then, you know, who, who are you going to believe? Um, or the Toronto Star goes to Kandahar and says, you know, this Kandahar, the, the Dala Dam that CETA is saying is such a success. Well, I've been interviewing farmers and they're saying they're not getting water in the irrigation channels and the whole thing has been a white elephant. So it, what we need is, is more openness. Um, and, and I think the government has made things worse by repeating over and over and over accountability. And our, our, our previous minister, Julian Fantino, kept saying, CETA will be accountable for every nickel. And that's sort of saying, we will never fail at anything. And that leads to huge risk averseness and even paralysis. In fact, Molly has written about this in the past. Uh, the the risk-averse culture at CETA because everybody is so afraid of making a decision and then being blamed for it when it goes wrong, and also because they don't have any kind of guidance. We don't have an overall vision for uh, Canadian development and what its goals should be. We have a bunch of... Actually, I should let Molly speak. Yeah. She's written about it, <laughs> rather than paraphrase her. Well, Molly, yeah. Oh, I'm I afraid we only have a few minutes left, so not, I would love to keep going, but we are approaching the end. But please, Molly, go ahead. Um, well, I'll drop the uh, DFIT example and pick up on the word accountability because I think we really oh. need to unpack that word a little bit. And I know that we plan to talk about it, so I'll just throw it in here. We really focus on a fiduciary accountability to, to the point where it sometimes it hampers our ability to do development accountability, to so have a genuine dialogue around our programs and projects 
and to actually say, okay, well, this isn't working, this is working, how do we move forward? I, I, when I was doing my uh, doctoral research, I actually found uh, papers uh, that basically said the auditors were saying that we were spending too much money tracking down every penny and not actually doing the development. So if the auditors are now saying this has gone too far, maybe we need to sort of unpack this idea of accountability and bring it out in the Global Mail and in the public debate to say, are we looking at accountability just purely as finance or accountability through parliament or accountability through people being engaged citizens and holding their government to account? And those are kind of different definitions. Hmm. Sorry. And I would just add, I think these are all such great points. And I would just uh, add that on the UK side, I think you had the political leadership, but you also had major external institutions that were helping to prompt and even give a broader space for political leadership. And that included places like ODI, the Overseas Development Institute, producing a lot of work over a long period of time that, you know, unpacked a lot of these topics that are coming up right here so that they were in front of the journalists every day for years. And uh, similarly, you had eminent uh, economists like Nick Stern, uh, who were, you know, really taking on a lot of the technical issues on a generational basis as well. Uh, in different hats and and crucially you did have uh, data and now the one campaign people like uh, Jamie Drummond uh, you know people know about Bono and uh, and so forth but there was a lot of heavy lifting Justin Forsyth who now runs Save the Children UK these were really deep policy experts who were in the trenches every day brilliant people brilliant minds uh, trying to you know figure out how to find success and so there, this constellation of actors it is really crucial. And, and so I just want to, in the last few minutes we have, ask each of you, you know, if you were to pick a top two or three priorities, uh, we do have an election coming up in 2015, uh, in the fall, in October 2015. It's anyone's guess who might win. Uh, but I'm curious, given all the things we've been talking about, for Canada, not necessarily for a government or a MCDA or a minister or what have you, for Canada to succeed in this broader, more comprehensive sense we've discussed, we've been discussing. What are the types of things that you would see as the top couple of priorities, say from here to the fall of 2015? Hmm. Maybe David, do you want to start? <laughs> I was afraid of that. Um, uh -oh. I, I think. Um, I think that you've made some really interesting points, and Stephen has as well, about uh, the importance of the, the knowledge base um, and the societal base for the kind of uh, development uh, policy debate that has unfolded in the UK. Uh, and I guess the point that I would make about that is that if we were talking about the UK a generation ago, people would be much less optimistic. These kinds of environments can be fostered. And so if, if I had one wish, it would be that we would uh, move uh, um, move towards a much, as I think Molly has said, a more humble uh, but a more knowledge intensive environment around these issues in Canada in which uh, there is uh, a much more uh, contingent um, evidence-based uh, deeply uh, felt approach to uh, grappling with these issues that is based on um, a long-term commitment to shared interests in addressing some of the most profound challenges that will have a, a, a deep impact on the Canadian trajectory going forward. So that's not a specific objective. There, those can be tied to a number of specific thematic objectives. But we need to change the climate and the culture uh, with which we address these issues as, as a society. I have a wish, too. Great. Go for it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how aid is only part of the equation and it's not just aid that produces that development and that's very true. And uh, a lot of people raise the issue of, you know, remittances from people from the Global South, sending back money from their temporary jobs in the Global North has, is more important than foreign aid or foreign direct investment or things like that. And there's also a lot of talk about policy coherence. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that CETA was recently folded into foreign affairs and international trade to create a super ministry. So my wish is to go beyond facile statements around, you know, oh, remittances are more important or, you know, 
foreign investment or, you know, just throwing in, you know, pri private sectors, the way of the future or public private partnerships and to actually think more carefully um, about policy coherence, but policy coherence for development. So that, um, you know, if we're going to have development and trade in the same ministry, that they really be on an equal footing. And in fact, I would like to put development first because I think that all Canadian policy that considers global issues should take into account the priorities and needs of people in poor and less powerful countries. And so, you know, to say that lifting trade tariffs would do a lot more good than foreign aid is actually, it's very true, but it's not enough. Because often that's used as an argument to sideline foreign aid and say that foreign aid isn't important. What I would say is that we should do something like reduce tariff barriers and take other measures that will help developing countries develop. Um, and then use foreign aid more, strategic, more strategically to address the ones that are left behind by that. So globalization might be a force that's helpful for some countries, but other ones, especially uh, fragile ones, conflict-affected ones, might need foreign aid more than ever. So rather than using policy coherence as either a way to use the foreign aid budget as you know the pot of gold that, that what used to be CETA to reach Canadian goals, I think we should use Canadian policies writ large as a way of helping those who are most marginalized around the world. That's my wish. That's great. We shouldn't compare, as I said in my thing, we shouldn't compare the Canada Health Act with NAFTA. There, there are two different instruments for two different purposes, but we think they go together. <laughs> Absolutely. Molly, please. Okay, well, I guess I get to make a wish, too. And my wish it was more along the lines of how we sort of engage that mature dialogue. And that is more about global linkages and sort of seeing the linkages not just between, you know, Development just doesn't come through the government and then to the south. It's about the linkages from citizen to citizen and how we get that global dialogue going. And, and using more than just the Global Mail to do that, we have this wonderful venue and many, more internet, many other internet services to sort of get that dialogue going and sharing across that way. I think youth programs do that. Um, but that sort of intuitive understanding needs to be built up by, in, a, in a dialogue more than anything else. And of course my other wish would be to uh, unpack the word accountability and, and have a look at that. <laughs> well this is a tremendous start. If, if the goal is a more knowledge intensive environment, I think this type of conversation uh, is a great one. And exactly as you say, I think that the new technologies do allow much more uh, diffuse, decentralized, and engaged conversations uh, between citizens and journalists, between parliamentarians and uh, and citizens, and and everything in between, and ho hopefully corporate leaders, academic leaders, and uh, and non-governmental leaders too. So, I just want to thank all of you, uh, both for joining this conversation, and such uh, making such terrific contributions, but also for the tremendous contributions you're making every day, because uh, I think. Uh, everyone who's out there who might have the uh, pleasure to watch uh, you and read your work, uh, we all owe a, a great debt to the, the tremendous effort and intellectual leadership you provide uh, for us as Canadians to try and think this through. So thank you for that. And I will just add that uh, there is a major conference happening uh, at Dalhousie this weekend on uh, launching a new uh, Canadian aid conversation and uh, more intensive as I understand it, uh, or intensified uh, research effort to take this on on a collaborative basis uh, across the academic community but also outside of the academic community. So uh, I uh, am excited to uh, see how that goes and look forward to, uh, to helping however I can but uh, just want our viewers uh, who might have the chance to watch to know that you are all thinking very hard about how to not just carry your own work but to, to build the broader collective so thank you. Thank you, Thank very you much. John, and also for stimulating and guiding the conversation. Delighted to be with you all, and hope we can do it again soon. Good. Definitely. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Bye for now, John.